so in lockdown session uh, we are conducting a virtual conference on light for innovation art and education and uh, uh, we have successfully finished our first session uh, that is light talk on 8 may hope you guys have enjoyed a lot and this talk delivered by three speakers first one by abhin burgis second one by uh, devi prasad and third one by rajeshwari so basically in this talk covered all the building block of optics and photonics background so and they explain uh, explore about the application of uh, this area optics and photonics in real life so now question is arises how um, how to fabricate or simulate photonics device or photonic integrated circuit for practical realization so the answer will you will get here in light workshop today so the uh, today uh, today the uh, there will be two talk first one by mr vipreto mayer he will introduce about introduction to photonics fabrication and second talk by abhishek mr abhishek mall he will give an introduction about uh, photonics modeling so here we will get uh, more details about fabrication and simulation of photonic device and uh, for uh, to reach us uh, you uh, you can <coughs> find us in all the social media platform twitter and follow in facebook and you can, for more in, uh, course inquiry you can mail us for more details you can uh, reach us at our official website Photonics student chapter IIT Bombay. Now comes to the today light workshop talk. Uh, the talk will be on photonic device fabrication, which will be delivered by Mr. Vipreto Mayer. I will just inter, uh, give a brief uh, intro of uh, our speaker. Uh, Mr. Mr. Vipreto is a PhD scholar at uh, CENSE, Center for Nanoscience and Engineering in ISE Bangalore. He is working under Professor Sankar K. Selvraza at Photonic Research Laboratory. His research interests include process integration, integrated optics, and micro optomechanical system for sensing applications. He has more than 10 plus paper research articles in optics and photonics field. So let's welcome Mr. Vipruto Mayer to deliver a talk on fabrication of um, photonics device. Vipruto Mayer. Yeah. yeah. Okay, please share yeah. your uh, screen. Uh, okay, so a little announcement for audience. So uh, for question and uh, answering, raise your hand option in below. You can find it. And uh, host will unmute your mic. Then you may um, have a one-to-one -one conversation with uh, our speaker. Or else you may uh, text message your question in chat box. Uh, we will take care. OK, thanks. So Mr. Uh, Viprato, may we start the talk? OK. So, uh, Mayor. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kishore, for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the Photonic Student Chapter IIT Bombay for inviting me to speak at uh, Light for Innovation through an education uh, workshop. Uh, so, uh, as the speaker have introduced, I am Vipet uh, Omire. I am a PhD student at the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering, uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. So uh, today, uh, the title of my presentation uh, is on um, photonics device fabrication. So uh, photonics, uh, as we have listened, uh, as, uh, as, uh, yesterday we have a nice session on the introduction to photonics. So photonics uh, is uh, basically the generation and manipulation of light. So uh, it has become a very important part of our daily day to day living. For example, it is used in sensing, communication, space technology, and high-speed computing. So um, compared to the traditional electronic systems, why is it so different uh, photonics? So photonics gives us the advantage of high bit bandwidth, high sensitivity, and immune to electromagnetic magnetic interference. So um, high band bandwidth, uh, a good example is that nowadays we have, a very, we have very fast internet 
So that is one uh, very good example of uh, photonics uh, being used in our day-to-day -day life. And um, in sensing, in, uh, in, uh, in sensing, photonics uh, offers one of some of the most sensitive techniques to uh, measure different types of gases, chemicals, and also uh, the uh, the uh, last. Uh, Point is that it is uh, this all this photonic device most uh, it is immune to electromagnetic interference. So uh, going forward, uh, so uh, these different applications are achieved by uh, combining these different optical components. So uh, for achieving this uh, uh, the requirements, we need a laser source, uh, a kind of uh, diffraction grating. As, uh, so these diffraction gratings are used to separate out different colors of light. And if you want to filter a, a single wavelength of light or a color of light, you can use optical filters. Or if you want to measure uh, the intensity of light or the power uh, of light, you can either use a detector. So um, these different discrete components can be combined to meet a specific requirement or an application. So if you combine all these things, since they are discrete, it becomes a very big uh, device overall. So, uh, and again, uh, since uh, they, uh, if, uh, you have to buy it separately, so it becomes more expensive. So the question comes, can we make it smaller or can we make it co more cost effective? So one way is yes, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so one way to do it is uh, to use photonic integrated circuits. Uh, so uh, photonic integrated circuit uh, is a technology that offers integration of various optical components and or optical function functionalities on a single chip, taking the advantage of micro and nano fabrication. So here uh, in the figure, I'm showing an example of photonic circuits. So uh, using a photonic circuit, you can uh, divide power into different channels and you can, using ring-like structures, you can uh, filter out uh, different colors of light. And if you want to tune this uh, filter, you can have uh, on-chip heaters that can be used to tune the, uh, this type of uh, filter operation. And also you can have an on-chip photodetector. So um, similar to the um, electronics where um, uh, copper wires are used to conduct electrons, here in the same case, uh, in, uh, in the same way, here a uh, waveguide is one of the basic building blocks which is used to connect different uh, components and also it is used to transport light. So uh, uh, this waveguide is a very important component uh, for uh, for building as well as connecting different components. So another uh, advantage this photonic integrated circuit offers is that it can it can be made in a wafer scale. So here's an example of a photonic integrated circuit which is made on on a wafer scale, which uh, basically means that you can make multiple copies of photonic integrated circuit and there's a possibility of mass fabrication. So you can uh, print a lot of different devices in, in this kind of wafer. So here I'm showing a zoom view of, of, um, of uh, uh, around this section showing that different waveguide configurations can be printed uh, using uh, the same technology that is used uh, for making IC fabrication, the electronic uh, uh, electronic uh, circuit fabrication. So um, here I'm just showing some of the few applications, but the applications are endless. Uh, so for, uh, these are some of the most common applications uh, photonic circuits are being used. So the first area is communication, sensing, and high-speed computing. So uh, today in this uh, talk, uh, so I would present uh, a brief introduction on optical waveguides. What is the criteria for uh, the material selection. And uh, I'll present the fabrication process flow. So in fabrication, um, there are two uh, basic steps or there are two basic processes such as op uh, optical lithography or sorry, uh, lithography and etching. Which these are the two steps which can be used to fabricate a, a, a device. So I'll explain uh, um, about lithography and etching. And then um, for patterning, uh, photonic circuits, electron beam lithography is a very versatile uh, tool. So it's a very versatile technique uh, with which you can have 
uh, you can print or you can pattern very fine features. So this is one of the advantages. So I'll be discussing discussing in detail in the following. So um, in uh, in an optical waveguide, uh, so the, in the laptop I'm showing an uh, optical fiber. So light propagates through the process of total internal reflection. So the right hand uh, top is showing a uh, uh, cross section of the optical fiber. So uh, inside the core, which uh, light is bouncing back and forth. That's how light propagates through an uh, optical fiber. So one of the criteria to fulfill this is that the core refractive index should be greater than the cutting refractive index. So this is uh, optical fibers are usually circular in nature. So uh, the question is, can we make it on a planar substrate, something like this? So if you have a silicon dioxide uh, uh, bottom layer and you have a uh, and then you have a silicon which has a refractive index of three, and then you have air on top. So this satisfies this. So uh, this condition of total internal reflection. So in the vertical direction, uh, light can be confined. So uh, the question is, how can we confine in the horizontal direction? So the horizontal direction can be achieved by just removing the material on the sides. So here on the left side, uh, the same operation or the same functionality that is uh, there in the optical fiber can be achieved in the planar substrate also. So my, by defining rectangular type of structures. So here uh, I'm showing an example of a, a, a simulation which is showing that uh, the red color indicates uh, the light is confined inside the silicon. So the thickness is just 220 nanometers and the width is 450 nanometers. So this indicates that devices are very small and compact. So uh, the question comes, how do we select this material? What material is best? and uh, what material is suitable for guiding light. So the material selection, um, again, I'm taking the example of an electronic circuit. So in electronic circuit, uh, copper is used because um, it offers the minimum resistance. So here in this, uh, similarly in optics, so if you want to have a, a material which you want to transport light, so you want to have minimum absorption so that it can travel a very long distance. So it turns out that uh, silicon and silicon dioxide is a very good material and which is transparent uh, in the telecom uh, regime. So it can be used for telecommunication application. Another advantage is that silicon and silicon dioxide, you can directly use uh, the fabrication process, which is developed for IC fabrication. You can directly use to make uh, silicon waveguides. So nowadays, uh, silicon, um, uh, silicon on insulator uh, wafers are available. So it will come in this kind of stack. So the right hand shows an actual wafer. So the stack will, will look something like this where the device is made on a thin 220 nanometer layer. So the next step is how do we make waveguides in this kind of structure? So um, the fabrication, uh, so this is the fabrication process flow. So one of the uh, three basic uh, steps is cleaning, lithography and etching. Uh, today I'll not be discussing uh, much about cleaning, but cleaning uh, is one of the most uh, essential step and is one of the most important step. But uh, uh, so, but the take-home message for cleaning is that uh, it removes contamination uh, from the wafer. So it is one of the first step that is used. Uh, so in lithography, uh, as I've shown in the cartoon here, so lithography is a step which involves patterning of the design. Uh, on an intermediate polymer film. For example, you have a design uh, in your computer. You want to translate on your substrate. So what lithography does is that uh, you'll fit it into a pattern generator which recognizes your design. And then uh, through lithography, uh, uh, your patterns can be transferred on an intermediate polymer. So here the red, uh, uh, red thing is a polymer, a thin film or uh, polymer that is coated on the wafer. And follow, followed by this is that uh, polymer is used as a mask and then uh, the exposed part gets removed. So that's the etching. etching. Uh, so the etching helps in transferring the pattern on the desired substrate. So we'll uh, have a look at uh, lithography and etching uh, one by one. So the first step in lithography is coating. So uh, to get something like this. So how do we do that? So uh, uh, so the coating is done by a process called spin coating. So in spin coating, um, 
the wafer is placed on a chuck, uh, which is held together by vacuum, and then the solution or the polymer is being dispensed. So here uh, in the right hand, I'm showing a figure where uh, a person is directly pouring uh, the polymer onto the wafer, and this is the wafer and this is the chuck. So, and uh, um, in order to get a very uniform uh, coating on the, on the surface, the wafer has been rotated at a very high speed. By this, we can achieve a very uniform and very, very thin layer. So basically the photoresist is, uh, or the resist is a polymer, which is uh, sensitive to UV or electron V. So um, now we have achieved this. The next step is to pattern on this. So the pattern can be achieved by either electron beam lithography. So here I am ex I'll be explaining about electron beam lithography, but there are other methods uh, uh, such as optical lithography by which you can do the same process. So in an electron beam lithography, the right hand side uh, is an actual lithography machine. So the design is being loaded on this computer and here's the pattern generator. And then there's the, this is the electron beam lithography tool. So the design, uh, the pattern generator uh, generator recognizes your design and then the beam is deflected according to your design. So by the deflection of the beam, uh, you, you can write or pattern your uh, desired uh, pattern. So after the exposure is done onto the polymer, uh, the next step is to put into a solution or a chemical, which is also known as a developer. So the exposed part will get dissolved. So so this step, uh, what we have achieved is that the design, uh, your the pattern or the design which is there in your computer gets translated on this thin uh, uh, intermediate polymer layer. So uh, like I've said, the next step is etching. So what is etching? So etching is basically a substructive method or uh, it's basically the, uh, uh, the removal process by which uh, the unprotected part uh, of the resist gets removed. So here, when you expose to a chemical, uh, uh, the chemical can be a chemical reaction or it can be either be an iron bombardment. So the portion which is not protected by uh, the resist, it will get removed. So in etching, um, there are two possible things that can happen. One is isotropic etching and one is anisotropic etching. So in isotropic etching, the H rate or the removal rate is uh, uh, same in all the directions. So you will end up in some, something like this, which is uh, not desirable because we want something like this, but we end up something like in, uh, in, in a structure which looks like this. The other is anisotropic etching, where the vertical direction uh, removal rate is faster than the horizontal. So you'll get a, a structure which is, looks similar like this. So I, uh, I, isotropic etching happens in a, uh, when you use uh, liquid chemicals, but uh, dry etching, uh, anisotropic happens in a dry etching process. Uh, so the advantage of dry etching is that you can use gases. So, and by tuning the parameters, you can get an isotropic etching. So uh, one way to achieve it is to use a uh, reactive ion etching. So reactive ion etching is a directional etching process, which uses a combination of both. For example, you'll have ion bombardment, and you'll have chemical reaction. So by this way, you can achieve uh, a structure which looks something similar to this. So how do we do reactive ion etching? So reactive ion etching can be, uh, basically is a plasma etching. So uh, uh, you'll put your substrate in a chamber, uh, which consists of two electrodes, and then you'll supply a gas. So when you apply a right amount of uh, voltage, uh, the electrons will, uh, 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 the accelerated electrons will come and hit the uh, gases, gas molecules, and then it will ionize. So by this way, it will uh, also uh, generate very high uh, uh, reactive uh, radicals. So when these radicals and ion comes and interacts with the surface, the unprotected part gets removed. So this is uh, a process uh, uh, by which and the un unprotected part gets etched or moved via chemical reaction or uh, bombardment. So, uh, so this is the com uh, complete process step by which uh, the, uh, the intended design, which is there in your computer, gets transferred on your substrate. Uh, so, but uh, this is not the end of the story. So, 
uh, some of the problems that you can face. So the indented design is something like that, but in the actual, you might get something like this. So discontinuity of roughness. So discontinuity, uh, so since light propagates through the process of total interfection, this kind of discontinuity light may leak out. So it, it, uh, at this kind of uh, junction. So this is not uh, something it should be avoided while making your, uh, making a photonic integrated circuit. So, uh, so where does this come from, uh, this kind of uh, errors? So basically it comes from the patterning. So let's look at the patterning technology uh, techniques. Uh, uh, let's have a closer look at the techniques. So uh, basically the, one of the most common patterning technique uh, is the area mode patterning, which is also known as deflection of electron beam. Or, so by, uh, what I mean by that is that the uh, the electron beam is being deflected, uh, and then you get the uh, patterning. So let me play it once more. So the you have this electron source, and the, you you deflect the beam, and then you get this kind of structure. But uh, in a photonic integrated circuit, the uh, devices are quite long, and it's it covers a large area. So, but this deflection, the electron has a limited range. So how do we write uh, uh, this long? Uh, long circuit or uh, which covers a very large area. One way to do it is uh, to divide this area into small boxes, which is also known as right field. And uh, you can um, deflect the electron beam in, in, in a small area, and then you can move the stage, and then you can write this, and then you can uh, write the complete area. Uh, but the problem is uh, here is that uh, as you keep on writing over time, the stage has some uh, has, uh, has some drift or over time because of uh, because of the noises uh, in the tool. So this kind of uh, this kind of noises and uh, results into a misalignment in within this two area or this area. So as a as a result, uh, there's a very this is a very common uh, problem that you face in area mode writing where you'll have this kind of discontinuity. So Stitching error, uh, as we have this, uh, discussed in the previous slide, it results into high optical losses. So how do we avoid this? So uh, in order to avoid this, one way to achieve it is to use a method called fixed beam moving stage. So as the name suggests, you fix the beam and then you just move the stage. So by this way, you can eliminate stitching error and you can write a stitching error free over a long uh, over a large area so this will completely eliminate that uh, the problem that we had in the previous slide so uh, let's look closely at the uh, wave uh, photonic integrated circuit so as, as i've explained in the pre first slide photonic integrated circuit uh, uh, waveguide uh, connects different components but Different components does not necessarily mean that you know, everybody, all the width will be uniform. So in order to efficiently connect or couple light from one uh, width to another width, uh, there's uh, something called taper, which is uh, basically a, basically a, a varying type of uh, structure. Uh, so by this kind of structure, you can connect two different uh, widths. Uh, so basically, what I mean is that you can efficiently couple light from one system to another system. So this is very important uh, for uh, making a very efficient photonic circuit. Uh, so, so can we write with this uh, FDMS structure? So the answer is no. You can write this, you can write this, but you cannot write this. Uh, so this, com this limitation comes from the tool. So uh, the FDMS uh, does not allow that. Uh, so uh, to overcome this, one way is to use a combination of both FBMS and area. So you write the uh, taper area uh, using an area mode, and then you connect that. But again, the problem is that um, this, uh, the stage drifts over time, as I have explained in the previous slide. So you'll end up in uh, something like this. So you'll have some alignment error at the overlap region between FBMS and area. So uh, we have come up with a, a technique, which is uh, uh, FBMS tapering technique. So in this way, all the circuit is written, written using only FBMS. 
So the larger widths are written by combining uh, multiple FBMS uh, parts. And, in, uh, and as you come closer, uh, you fix both the parts to a common point. In the process, you form a tapered-like structure. So here is an actual uh, SEM image, which is showing that this kind of uh, discontinuity on the left-hand side is completely eliminated. So by this way, you can achieve a very smooth and um, element error-free patterning using FBMS only. So uh, here is an example which I'm about to show. So here uh, on the bottom right, I'm trying to, uh, be, uh, I'll try to explain how to achieve this kind of structure. So uh, here uh, you would like to pattern a tapered structure and a waveguide and a, and a corrugating structure, which is uh, uh, also known as a grating. So uh, the process is similar. So you start off with an SOI wafer, which uh, here the brown color indicates uh, silicon and uh, blue is uh, silicon dioxide. So the first step is to do uh, coat and do electron beam lithography. So this is after you pattern and then develop. So uh, the, the exposed part gets removed in the developer. And the next step is to do etching. So in, in the etching, you put inside an RIE and what it, uh, uh, the complete silicon gets removed. So the, uh, in this portion, silicon gets removed. So and you time it in such a way that once it's, um, when it reaches silicon dioxide, you turn off the uh, process. So, uh, so the waveguide, uh, this part is achieved. So the next step is to pattern this corrugating, corrugating structures. So next, so in order to do that, uh, we do another EVM lithography where we define, uh, we pattern only in this portion. So here in this case, you, uh, after patterning this and putting in the developer solution, this part gets removed or dissolved. So, and then you can do another uh, RIE and then you remove the, you remove the uh, 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 photoresist. So this is a complete process flow for making a waveguide and the coupling structures. So by following the same procedure, we made uh, fabricated uh, photonic integrated circuits. So here I'm showing a wise picture where uh, this kind of structures can be used different um, uh, it can be uh, used to split light, and then this kind of uh, wire to slot is used to combine light into a single waveguide. So, in summary, uh, I have explained about uh, the material. Uh, uh, what is the criteria for selection uh, for for the uh, uh, criteria for selecting a waveguide material, uh, which is based on the transparency, and then lithography and etching can be combined to pattern. Uh, uh, to transfer a pattern on a substrate. And then uh, we have explained uh, about uh, fixed beam moving state pattern technique, which eliminates stitching error. And then uh, finally, I have presented about a uh, patterning method, which uh, uh, by using only FBMS. So I'd like to thank uh, organizers and my colleagues at IAC Bangor uh, for. So this is my group, and then uh, we, this is uh, uh, our clean room where, uh, where we are doing our experiments. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Vipratto, for introducing and exploring the uh, fabrication technique from basic to sophisticated CMOS technique that involved in photonic device fabrication by step by step. Now move to the question answer session. So audience, please raise your hand and ask the question in chat box. Dear audience, any doubt, any questions? Uh, one question. Uh, how efficient is electron beam lithography for 3D fabrication? Mr. Vipratu, please explain. Uh, so uh, 
Electron beam lithography, uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a planner technique. So uh, for 3D, uh, 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 as far as uh, what you can achieve is just a planner's uh, device. And it's, uh, what I mean to say is that uh, you cannot uh, make 3D structures. So 3D structure, um, uh, you, uh, you would need, uh, so what you would do is you uh, pattern one structure and on top of that, you deposit another structure. So by that way, you can you have to do multiple alignment. So that is uh, something you have to do. But uh, electron beam is as such, it's very precise. And you can, as long as you can um, identify what is beneath uh, uh, in the bottom layer, you can always uh, do uh, 3D types of pattern. I hope the, that answers your question. OK, so one, one thing I will include in this uh, question. So for 3D and 3D fabrication, so I would suggest uh, go for the 3D laser lithography that is more efficient than uh, electron beam lithography, which is very fast to write the patterns as compared to electron beam lithography. Yeah, correct. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, come to the next question uh, uh, is from CV. What are the difference in fabrication process of MEMS sensor and uh, optical uh, optical sensor? Mr. So, oh, uh, yeah, uh, so in MEM sensors, uh, so uh, optical sensors, uh, you can make it without any moving parts, but in MEM sensors, uh, uh, you need some kind of moving parts. For example, you need to have a cantilever or something like that. So uh, the, you use the same process, but uh, again, uh, the tool, say so etching, everything is same, but you tune it in such a way that uh, uh, you either make a, a structure which is not movable or so the, the only difference is that in MEMS you will have some part which will be moving so uh, the, the principle is different so the fabrication is slightly different so I think that's the basic uh, difference for example in, uh, in optical sensor you just need a waveguide that's all uh, uh, but in MEMS you need some kind of suspended structures like cantilever or uh, accelerometer. So uh, it has to be hanging uh, on some uh, anchor or something like that. So that's the primary difference. OK, thanks for explaining. Uh, another question is, uh, can you talk more on negative and uh, positive photoresist? Uh, OK, uh, yeah. This question is very preliminary. So you yeah. can uh, get it from just uh, Google search and all. Uh, Please uh, give a brief uh, overview about it. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm not sure whether you can use a pen or something. So I'll just try to uh, draw it here. So in a positive re resist, so if this, this is the electron beam, if you expose this part, and if this is negative resist, uh, if, you, uh, if you expose this part, so after development, uh, you put into the solution, what you will end up is that you will end up something like this. But in the negative resist, uh, you will end up something like, like this. So uh, so in this case, what, what happens is that the, when you expose uh, this polymer, the polymer starts bre breaking and then it gets dissolved in the solution. In the negative part, uh, when you expose with an electron beam, uh, the polymer uh, linkage starts happen. So it becomes more resistant to the uh, dissolution. So the other parts get uh, dissolved and this part remains. So this is the primary difference between positive and negative resist. Okay, thanks for the explanation. Any more question, audience, please? Okay, so we are not getting any more question. Okay, we are running time late. So next, uh, move to the next uh, uh, next talk. So let's thank Mr. Vipritu uh, for excellent talk on device fabrication. 